Arteta! What a strike! The draw is out for the Europa League quarterfinals. And lest you had any concern about yesterday, there's no sign of Spurs anywhere. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith, the Blackman on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Um, so look, obviously, we need to talk about Arsenal losing to Olympiacos. But I think important to reiterate, Arsenal have gone through. The draw has been made. We are going to discuss that draw. It is important to discuss that draw. And it is important to discuss our game. But neither of those things are anywhere near as important as discussing. Tottenham Hotspur, it happened again. Tottenham Hotspur, can't smile without you. Tottenham Hotspur, the joke is always on them, forever in our shadow, whatever you want to say. The fact is, what do you think of Tottenham Hotspur? Shit. What do you think of shit? Tottenham Hotspur. And I submit that they have one up themselves by taking a 2-0 lead in the first leg and crashing out to Dinamo Zagreb, whose coach was literally in prison. So we will get to all of that quite delightfully with Paul. You can find him on Twitter at Pause My Pants. Hold pause. Woo-hoo. And Clive, you can find Monter at Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Tim and I managed just 22 minutes yesterday on Patreon uh, on the Tottenham Hotspur, the history, the history of the Tottenham uh, football heritage. Yeah, we we covered it all, and we will cover it all again here. I want to say thank you so much for being with us and celebrating this moment. Things for Arsenal a little rosier than maybe they were just weeks ago, just months ago. Ever looking up, winning the derby at the weekend, then watching uh, Spurs calamitously crash out. And uh, we went through with no issues whatsoever. I would say perfectly well done. So we do want to talk about the game. I mean, that is ultimately what we are here to talk about. But uh, Clive, look, when Tottenham do what Tottenham do, you got to take some time and enjoy it. And I just um, I just thoroughly enjoyed every last damn thing about it. So how do you feel about Jose Mourinho being outcoached by a man who could only talk to his team by placing a collect call? Um. Yeah, so we spoke about Spurs pre the uh, derby, didn't we? And I do feel, and I've said for a little while now, that Spurs have a problem and they don't really know they have one. We have problems, but I think we know we have them and we're trying to fix them. I think Spurs are in this lovely place where they think they're actually going forward and they're going backwards. And it's really hitting their fan base right now because going out of Europe and losing to Arsenal in one week, that makes you look at yourself really closely. And the way they lost to us last week was... The goal is attacking players on the pitch and they're not attacking. They're not using them. They've got no idea how to build up play. So we moan about our team, but we can build up. Right? So they've got no clear pattern, no clear way to get it to their superstar talent up top. And so they just play lumpy football. And we we rewatch it, we it and we see how much time that their non-ball playing defenders have the ball. I mean, it's just, there's no chance of any consistent build up. And, it, you know, we're talking about a coach on £50 million a year. And he's constructed a team. But I don't know what this is. You know, um, they do have an ability to accumulate points due to their efficient strikers, but I can't help but look at them and think, you know what? I'm glad they're out, but I wouldn't have feared them if they were in. Mm. So I just don't think they're. I just don't think they're very good in the football. So um, yeah, but but setting aside whether they're any good, Clive, do do any of our? I mean, do any of our sphincters need to be clenched that tightly over a period of two weeks? I mean, do we really? Need yeah, that? <laughs> it is. Yeah, there is a stress factor, and we don't. I don't need that to be honest. I'm already reaching for my inhaler enough when we play them. So um, it's a tough one, but I have to say, I'm. I think I rather focus on us at the moment. I, I'm just looking at them, and, and I'm thinking, you know what. We are better than them. And so we need to focus on making sure that everyone can see that by what we do next. And not we, what we mustn't do is go into our own lap of honour after we play a big game and we win and then turn out performances which don't really belie where we should be progression-wise. So Spurs, mate, they've got real issues, real problems, and they're about to hit because there's some players there that are expecting them to be more successful than they actually are. Their policy of these superstar type purchases, manager and on the pitch to build their brand, it's hitting a plateau and it's really, they've got one little cup to play for at the end of the season. You get a couple more league defeats and they're in a real, they're in a real problem place and a new stadium, lots of bills. There's a problem there, mate. It's coming. They could turn it around with five or six wins like anything, but there's a real problem developing there. What's this space? Yeah, I mean, I I love it. Look, Paul, 
Jose Mourinho is a revolutionary coach in so many ways. He, he's, he's just constantly innovating. And I think that innovation now is extending to his time at Tottenham because he has literally found a way to bend the space-time continuum and just skip straight to season three, Jose Mourinho. Um, you know, it used to be season three was, was the meltdown. But, you know, we are living in a fast-paced world, a digital world, a world of cryptocurrencies and non-fungible tokens and things are happening. And and for, for Mourinho to have been able to to create a third season meltdown without having to get to an actual third season, I think it is really uh, to his credit. Are you impressed by that, that ability to really uh, toy with Einstein's theory of relativity and space-time continuum? Um, he's gone early. He's he's premature ejaculated in his Mourinho um, stay. Uh, I can't believe it's happening now in front of us right now. Um, there was a great tweet yesterday. I wish it had been mine, but it wasn't. This guy, uh, Paul Asante Smith, tweeted, the Zagreb manager used his one phone call to call his team and say, lads, it's, <laughs> it's Tottenham. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> By the way, if you're not familiar with that, um, there is a, a famous story, potentially apocryphal, but famous nonetheless, of uh, Sir Alex Ferguson walking into the, the dressing room for a game against Spurs, and his entire team talk was, lads, it's Tottenham, and they went out and smashed him. <laughs> So it was just slowly. They got beaten by a guy with the number ninety nine on his shirt. I mean, mm. he shouldn't even have made. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> shouldn't have made the squad. It, it's like like the manager is in jail. The director has fled to Bosnia, and the team that didn't show up was Spurs. Um, it, it's just it was just wonderful. It's like you're planning to put a, set off a bomb to blow up Hitler. But you find it's better than that. It's not just Hitler. It's Hitler and all of his generals. It's Stalin. It's uh, Genghis Khan's coming along. And your ex-girlfriend who screwed you over for your best friend are all coming to the same room. We got Spurs. We got Mourinho. And they brought back Gareth Bale for us. All in one place, having a meltdown together. It's like, like I, I've only just turned on the news for the day just found out about the Europa League because I just wanted to live in that hour for as long as humanly possible. So I got another 12 hours out of it. It was just, oh, it was just, I mean, apparently we played on the same day, but oh my God, Jermaine Genus with that tweet about uh, seeing us in the Europa League final. He may see us in the Europa League final. He may. I mean, he'll be watching it on TV. It won't be because we're facing Spurs, but he may see us there, and we will get to that. Uh, The whole thing is delightful. It's just absolutely delightful. And Clive, I mean, look, I know you're an an Englishman. You're a big fan of the Three Lions. England football is important to you. Um, Mm -hmm. So as much as you don't like Spurs, it must have been painful for you to see such a, a seasoned pro, such a talented man, such a a highly capped, highly thought of, supremely talented English international as Eric Dyer be disappointed by this outcome. Um, that, that's that's got to be hard for you. And, and for the game to end with Eric Dyer clumsily fouling someone by not really being in control of any of his faculties, it felt fitting to me. Did it feel fitting to you? Trent Alexander-Arnold can't get in the team, but Eric Dyer... England yeah, see, now you're just why, now you're just looking at my timeline and getting me all wound up, right? <laughs> because that that decision alone just is I find disgraceful and not this either or. But it just shows you, you know what it shows me? It shows me the limitations of the coach. If you have a player like Trent Alexander Arnold and you don't know what to do with him, that means that's not about the player. That's about you. And forget about form. Form comes and goes, right? We've got our captain's a little bit out of form. Form comes and goes, but quality is there. You got to. You've got to work with that. But he'd rather work with hot carriers like Eric Dyer. You know, and um, for me, you get what you deserve. You get what you deserve. Marino wanted that player at Manchester United, what Man United paid £50 million for him. I mean, he literally is a hot carrier. And I don't know how he's managed to forge a successful football career because he has limits. If you build a system for those limits, then fine. If you're asking him to play football and play out all the rest of it, then not so fine. Because he can't do it, you know. So, um, hey, it's a challenge, right? But I tell you what, Elliot. I mean, I, I am. I don't like my big thing about Spurs is, you know, I'm not. A, I don't really dislike many things, but about about anybody. But I will say, I don't like how they 
get as much glory for doing so little. You know, I don't like how they manifest themselves in the press for being this successful team, and I just can't see it. I just literally can't see it. And the way that the two clubs are perceived by our English media, I, I find it quite disturbing. I don't, I just don't get it. We're seen as the foreign club, and they're seen as the as the club that's on the way up. And I think I'm looking at okay, spreadsheet wise, you look quite good, cash flow wise. But I'm telling you, when it comes down to it, you look in the near term, medium term, and going forward, I think we're far better positioned. I just don't think anyone's woken up to it yet, but mm. it soon it, will. It, it, soon it, will. Mourinho's I, severance package should even up the finances a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, there's no way Levy's paying him off. So he's he's here till 2023, my friends. Strap in and enjoy. Relegation, they got 45 points this season, so they're probably safe next season. You never know. Uh Harry Kane probably wishing he had taken one of those opportunities to leave to some place like Madrid um, at this point. But yeah, I mean, everything about that was just sensational. It's funny. I'm listening to the coverage as it's happening. And uh, when Zagreb goes ahead, one of the things a commentator said, you know, he's like, oh, Spurs now, they're, they're season teetering on the brink of collapse at one time, looking like title contenders in the Premier League. And I was like, no. No, there was never a time when they looked like title contenders in the Premier League. Just because you're top of the Premier League four games into the season, nobody thought Spurs were title contenders in the Premier League. Yeah, even a turd pops to the top for a little while before it sinks. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean, I I would say that uh, that's a perfect analogy because they play in a toilet bowl. Let's move on from Tottenham Hotspur, just like the Europa League has, and and talk about teams. Can I just say, I think we might have broken them. Yeah, well, I, you know, yes. I, 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 I didn't believe little... them. I just want to say, I think we might have broken them. I'm always here for giving us the credit for their collapse, although I, I think their collapse was inevitable. Um, and I hope that they are enjoying paying Gareth Bale and Jose Mourinho's wages um, because they are definitely getting the return on that investment, let me tell you. So, uh, having spoken enough about the turd that is Tottenham Hotspur and their hilarious collapse uh, and fall from Europe, we are into the quarterfinal. And let's just touch on the draw quickly. And then we can get to the game. I think it's going to be an interesting game to discuss because with a day of reflection, my my opinions of it have changed slightly. Um, you know, not that it was good or anything, but well, you know what? How about I just give you those opinions when we're actually talking about it? Let's instead <laughs> talk about the Europa League draw. And uh, Paul, I mean, it is, in my view, as close to the best we really could have hoped for. Um, let me just kind of read it out in case anyone doesn't know. On our side of the draw, we play Slavia Prague. Uh, who recently did dump Rangers out, nine-man Rangers, I should point out, in a game that had a lot of ugliness, including accusations of uh, racial abuse, which is unpleasant, obviously, and and you just can't understand why that shit still goes on, but it does. And then uh, Dinamo Zagreb plays uh, Unai Emery's Villarreal, so that would be our semifinal opponent if we get past Slavia Prague. On the other side of the draw, Ajax and Roma, two teams you wouldn't want to face, play each other. United play Granada. So... There is a chance, I mean, it all sets up, if it goes the way you think, for Arsenal to play in the final against Granada. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I mean, the, the United the United Arsenal final is, is alive and possible. And again, much like a Chelsea final in Europe, a United final in Europe would be both tasty and terrifying. Uh, but you really can't ask for much more than this. Th- the, I would say the three teams you most want to avoid are on the other side of the draw, unless you consider Villarreal one of them. Um and, and we'd only play them in the semifinal. So, so Paul, I mean, having now covered all the permutations yeah. and all the angles, why don't you find something to say about this that hasn't been said? Oh, it's great. So uh, we did our live stream yesterday, and uh, was it John uh, gave us a $2 tip or something and shared the wisdom that uh, and you gave out to me for slagging off somebody who was contributing to our, our live stream. But um, we were discussing us having to play Spurs and how much we dreaded that fixture just in case it all went tits up on us and uh, John was like well I prefer to play them now than in the final and I'm like how about we don't play them now and they don't make the final and I think that applies to like there's a really good chance we won't face United in the final we've got to get to the final but I want to play the uh, least uh, threatening teams along the way none of that oh you got to beat them sometime you really don't if they all pile up on the other side of the draw or they screw up you get to play shit teams all the way through to the final and then it's only one game against whoever and they might also be a very lucky um 
or overperforming shit team. So this is wonderful. Um, you still got to beat them. And we just, you know, they're, unless you play at your top level, unless Arsenal players are at, at our top level, like every one of these guys is going to be tricky. It's going to be over two legs. We saw exactly what I had anticipated with Olympiacos, um, which was, um, you know, the second leg, it's very hard to be up on your energy levels to the same level those guys are if they come at you. Um, Prague can be just as challenging and more challenging. Um, and then, you know, uh, Villarreal, they won't have the same inferiority complex. So it's not necessarily a tougher game. It'll be a more tactical game than than we than we might face against um, Prague. Um, all these all these challenges are going to be their own quirks. We seem to be able to make a Europa League uh, tie against anybody, something of a challenge. But that's the nature of the Europa League. I don't think <clears throat> nobody had an easy game yesterday. I mean, Spurs got twatted. Uh, United needed. Uh, Pogba to come on and remember he was a worldie because everybody else looked like vanilla. Um, it's e- each round's going to be a challenge, but but this is a lovely draw. There's a lot that makes football tricky right now for fans and players alike. Um, but Clive, I want to ask you a question. We we have this issue where we seem to make one leg hard work and the other mm-hmm. leg easy work. So I'm going to ask you a question. 2008. Do you remember the 2008 season? I bet if Tim was on, he would. Of course I do. <laughs> okay. Do you remember what happened in 2008 on October 23rd, Tuesday? Two th- sorry, 2007. I apologize. 2007. Uh, that 2007, 2008 team that, that probably should have won the title. Uh, but on Tuesday, October 23rd, 2007, something something happened. I can't remember. You tell me. Yeah, I'll tell you because I, I have it just committed to memory. Uh, on that day, Arsenal faced Slavia Prague. Does that ring any okay. bells? What the scoreline might yeah, have been we, on that day? We we smashed them, didn't we? Was it like um, it was a big score? I don't. I want to say I want to say seven, but I'm not sure that's right. You nailed but, it, seven nil to the Arsenal. And so my question yeah. for you is: If we win the first leg seven nil, do you feel confident we go through? Well, it depends. Really, it depends <laughs> if Tobias is playing in midfield. Right, <laughs> if he's playing in midfield, we got we got a problem because there's a few issues with his play. But if he's not there, I think we're stable enough to hold on to a seven nil. Yeah, I mean, I I, th- I think we could keep it. Look, I would take a seven nil in the first leg, but I, just real quick, I mean, we don't have to analyze the draw too much. There'll be time for that during the international break and other times, and we can get on to the game. But just as far as this breaks down, are you as happy with this draw as possible? I feel really happy. About it. I mean, look, facing Unai Emery in the semi final with his record in this competition and with his point to make towards the club would definitely fill some column inches. Um, but I, I still don't see how you can have any problems with this draw the way, the way it shook out. Yeah, it seems okay. You know, I think um, it's down to us really, isn't it? Because now, you know, Spurs are out, um, Milan are out. That's two more decent teams that have gone. Um, the pathway to semi final looks okay, but as we all know, it's not about the other teams because <laughs> we know we can beat every single one of these teams. You know, and we've already been in Manchester United this season. So it's not a problem. It's about us, really, and what we do. And that's where the doubt comes. And I think we have got to develop a level of, I said it already, stability. And I think it's something when we're looking to recruit in the summer, you have to think really carefully about our our levels. And I was talking on the podcast this week about sometimes when we're looking to recruit players, we are always looking to recruit based on player ceilings. And I do think we need to think about recruiting to re- introduce a much higher floor for this team. And when you re- when you recruit to a floor, you're recruiting to a level of consistency. And that's every week consistency. And the traumas of watching us, although I'm enjoying some of the results, the traumas are just too great because our inconsistency, even in-game, is so stark. Maybe we feel it more because we're emotionally invested, but... It feels so stark. Need more stable, solid technical players. And the game last night showed us what stable technical players can do and how they make you feel versus others that bring instability to the show. And I think 
need to move those players on, add more quality, add more consistency, physical and technical, introduce a higher floor, which means we always get 7 out of 10. No matter what we do, we walk out on the pitch, and I think we're going to be absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I, just, uh, I just feel... Like something is happening, and I realize it's hard. We've just lost to Olympiacos at home, and it, it, that feels bad, but we're through. Something feels like it's happening here, and I think that that gives us a chance to talk about this game. And, and Clive, uh, well, let me come back to you in a minute, because we only, we only have Paul for uh, 40 minutes today, unfortunately. <clears throat> so, Paul, look, on nights when we suffer or struggle, I, I think the, the common answer is to point to the manager. And I, I think that's true for any club, for any coach. I don't think it's an Arsenal thing. I think it's just the way it is. Because when a team struggles in a game where people expect there to be a performance, the default is the manager must have gotten something wrong. As far as the lineup he picks for this game, I think he pretty much got it spot on. I mean, maybe I would have liked to have seen Martinelli start. I think that would have been nice. But he rests the guys he kind of would like him to rest. Maybe Martinelli for Smith Rowe would have been my only nit to pick. But I don't have much problem with the team he picked. I think the issue with this game is that all of the analysis of it would be entirely different if one of, or preferably both of, the the two excellent, excellent early chances, relatively early chances, get put away. If Pepe gets it over to Aubameyang or it sneaks in, I'm not sure which he was trying, when he's put through by Ceballos, or if Aubameyang scores what I think is a very presentable chance, when again, put in by Ceballos, I think, first of all, that Ceballos himself would be discussed in a very different way, and this game would be discussed in a very different way. But after those missed chances, and I think the sense that it was going to be easy, the sloppiness kind of took over, and we maybe just got a little casual. So do you think that those that, that early period where we were very dominant, created the clear chances, didn't take them, do you think that that was sort of the, the fulcrum around which the analysis of this game and the performance generally pivoted? So, yeah, I think there's two halves to the analysis. We should have battered them. Uh, we pretty much did batter them, apart from the whole putting the ball in the actual net part of it. It was a destruction on XG. I mean, I realize that, you know, not everybody is here yeah. for XG, but we, we created enough chances to win two games. <laughs> yeah, we absolutely did what you're supposed to do on paper. Uh, the major issue was we had no control. And uh, we... it. I always feel Arteta came into the club thinking he wasn't going to uh, experience the arsenal he experienced under Arson, where we just got reamed on the counter. And this was the prototypical getting reamed on the counter. The, like, there's the Ceballos moment where he spills the ball. And yes, you know, he's responsible for getting dis- dispossessed. But the gap between Ceballos losing the ball and our back line with uh, basically three guys in it is half a football field with nothing in between. And Arteta talks. What I found most heartening is that Arteta talked about the issues after the game and, as far as I was concerned, nailed it in terms of sloppiness, uh, you know, loss of control, um, th- th- those moments... Um, uh, it, there's an interesting conversation around decision making and whether that can be improved. And he basically says uh, he, he, he implies you can improve everything. But when you get down to decision making, you know, that's pretty tough. Uh, and like some of our decision making in the in the box in the last moment, Pepe should have put it over to a Bamiyang. But you can understand why he had to go to try and finish off his movement once he ran to the keeper. There were plenty of decision making moments and. Uh, some bad finishing but the the other piece that stands out is just that loss of control and getting reamed on the counter and that that vacuum in midfield when it turned over it was very odd Mm. it was very reminiscent of previous seasons and I think specifically what uh, Arteta wants no part of and that all got sorted out once we made the subs Um, but yeah I mean we we did ha- we did the first half of the job creating all those chances that w- we should be putting away we should have absolutely buried these guys and we just really we just needed one goal to settle this whole tie down to make it unfeasible for them but we kept it feasible yeah and i mean 
The changes that wind up being made, <clears throat> Odegaard and party for El Nenny and Ceballos were obvious by the time they were made. Clive, I just want to touch on the, on the Ceballos performance very quickly, and we don't have to dig into it too deeply. We can talk about larger issues, but I did not come on this podcast intending to defend Ceballos. Mm. Um, I felt he had a poor game. The sloppiness, just the details, the in the positioning, all, all the things that you've generally had issues with with him before. I do feel for him a little bit because the thing I will say is he starts this game and he puts two chances on a plate with two very different types of passes. One touch turn, instant ball in behind for Pepe, <clears throat> beautifully done. The other popping up between the lines, a little dagger ball between center backs into Aubameyang right in space in the box where Aubameyang wants it. It should be two assists and the game should be two nil. And then the game is dead. And it goes on to wind up maybe being really ugly. Who knows? Takes the takes the edge off the finishing. It, 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 who knows what the scoreline looks like at that point. Instead, he winds up with no assists. And another turnover that leads to their goal, where in order for that turnover to lead to a goal, a couple other things have to happen, including a shot finding the only place it can get into the back of the net because every angle is covered, but it, it he basically banks it off of Gabriel into the net the only way it can go in. It just conspired to be a bad day for Ceballos. And yet... And again, I'm not defending some of the things he's bad at, but on another day, this this should be two assists and job done. And and I guess what I would say to you is, if Pepe and Aubameyang do what they should do in those situations, are we purring about Ceballos flourishing in a role that suits his his desire to come for the ball and, and move around? I, I guess I just, I, I want to be process-oriented here, and, and I do think it's a little harsh on him how bad he winds up looking in a game that he probably should have put out of reach of Olympiacos in the first 20, 25 minutes. Right, so for me, Sobias is is more easily sort of hidden as a third midfielder. Or mm-hmm. if you're on a if you're on a double pivot, make sure there's a back three behind him. And lastly, if you're on a double pivot, maybe play him on the left hand side of the double pivot. As Paul has said before, he's better on that left hand side coming on his right foot. That's what that's my view on him. When you're judging a player, try to try to look at it slightly differently because. My issues with, say, William, for example, and, and Tobias, and, and it's not so much their ability, because they can obviously play football. They're going to have good days. It's not a problem. They're going to have good days. When the game suits them, they're going to have good days. But for me, I look at the, the core of this team that's developing. I look at smith I look at Saka, I look at Pepe, I look at Bamiang, I look at Gabriel, I look at Tierney. There's a core developing in this team, Odegaard. And they play at a certain rhythm and energy mm. and a certain instantaneous movement and decision-making and body shapes, etc. When I look at Tobias, I look at Willian, I don't see the same energy. I don't see the same mesh into that core group. So Tobias could have a good day. No problem. He could have put, put two assists on. If you judge your player by assists, then good luck. William's got more assists than anybody else. I'm saying the same thing, right? It's about your energy, where we're going, our direction, how you play. That group of players I just mentioned, we they have good and bad days too, but they play with the right style, energy, psychology, sharing, timeliness of leave, the ball leaving your feet, the flow and the pace by which you play. And, and I see that in a group that's really developing in the club, and I don't see Tobias in that group. I don't see Willian in that group. It doesn't mean they're not good players. It doesn't mean they're not going to have good games. It just means where we're going, I don't see them directionally as that player. So if you look at Odegaard, it was so clear yesterday, wasn't it? It was so clear. We're, we didn't play great. You know, we didn't execute as we should have done. It doesn't matter. The game was done, right? So but as soon as Odegaard came on, it was, it was like opening the curtains, looking out the window. Oh, I can see. You know, and same for party when he came on. It's just, he made a couple of bad passes, but I felt better. I could see stability. I could see certainty. I mm. understood what was happening. And that's what you got to think about. Think about it in the team construct, not the players' completion and XA and X, I don't know what all these stats are. Right? No, you're good, you're SCA, good. That's good. Ex- XA, expected assists, there. baby. He had, yeah. he, had, he had them all. He had it all. I <laughs> am. <laughs> PPD, that one? Oh, that PPDA, one. Yeah, passes so, per defensive action. Th- throw an acronym at me. I'll, if, I, if I don't know it, I'll make yeah. it up. It, it, it is, that, that's directional stuff for me. That's directional. Okay, that looks cool. But 
your eyes tell you everything you need to know. When Sabaris is on the pitch, he just plays a different rhythm. And, and he does different things. He goes different places. He goes unexpected places. He's a, just a bit more of an individual. Some teams absolutely need that. Spurs could do a bit of that. But we're different. You know, we, we need to play to a rhythm, to a cohesion. And I think some days he's quite cohesive when he plays early and sharp and around the corner first time. Sometimes he's not. And more often when he's not confident, he's not. Because he tries to to make things better. He tries so hard to make things better. And for him to, to make things better, he needs to feel the football a lot. Mm. And that actually goes against the dynamic of the team. So yeah. for me, it's just a fit thing. It's nothing more than that. Yeah, I mean, the funny thing is, right, like, Ceballos gets a bit unlucky. It's a giveaway that leads to another goal. Three Europa League games in a row that he's played where he's given a goal to the opposition through a turnover um, or just a bad touch, I guess, however you want to look at that header. And that's bad. (laughs) I mean, there's no getting around it. And I thought he was generally sloppy throughout the game after that early bright start. The only reason I'm even raising the issue of, of feeling a little bad for him is he should have won the game early with, with, you know, really good creative play in the Odegaard role. And I think, you know, for me, I think what I'm looking at, you start to think about, is Ceballos going to stay at Arsenal? And I think it's increasingly unlikely that he would. But if he can get a 24-year-old midfielder who can kind of play between the lines and maybe sometimes play in the double pivot and becomes a squad player for you at 24 years old and, you know, let's say he's 15 million pounds. Like, it, it's tempting. Because at 26, 27 years old, when the market has sort of rebounded from COVID, he's probably going to be worth more than that. He's got two seasons under his belt at Arsenal. It's it's an easy way to just kind of replace outgoings if you think of, you know, maybe Willock leaves and maybe Maitland-Niles leaves and maybe Elneny leaves and even Shaka might leave and you need to get a new first-choice partner for party. And if you can inexpensively keep Ceballos, it doesn't feel like a dumb move. I just, it hasn't really happened for him. I think back to Project Restart when he looked so dominant and he hasn't really hit those levels again. And Clive, I think to your point, there's something about the way he plays and the way we want to play, the jugo de position or however you say that, and you know, the the more the more precise and and synchronized movements of players within this team structure that maybe doesn't suit the way he wants to play. I, I don't know. I thought I thought he was unlucky to not get the two assists his play deserved, but you saw the flaws elsewhere and in a tougher game, you know, maybe we would have paid for that. Um, you know, Paul, I mean I guess the other point is you've got a center forward in Aubameyang who comes back after being left out at the weekend. He's captain. He starts. He gets all the chances and he misses them all. <laughs> it's not ideal. Yeah. Um, I want to be disciplined in my process thinking, which is Aubameyang keeps getting chances, so that's a good sign. You know, good center forward play. One chance he's racing in behind, totally clear of the defense. One chance he's between two center backs in the middle of the box. One chance he's dead center of the box. One chance Pepe, if he slides it into him, it's a tap in. So it just doesn't happen for him today. But like, I can't help but be frustrated. Put one of those away. The one where he breaks in all by himself alone, it never looked like he was scoring. At no point during that moment, during his his run in behind did I feel like he was going to put it away. Um, you know, the one he spoons over is really particularly bad. I mean, is there a point at which this whole thing of, hey, as long as he's getting chances, he's playing well, gets set aside to just express some sheer frustration that this guy starting to develop the habit of missing too many presentable chances? Um, I mean, I'm fine with them. Uh, I think, uh, like, the other he thing had 1. I like about this expected game. goals all on his own in this game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and none scored. I mean, he tore them a new one with the runs. I mean, like... He, he, he got the chances. He also just like physically, athletically, like he's right there, which is what you want to be. You know, uh, we're worried about that cliff. Well, I think the cliff's way off at the moment. Uh, physically, he's he's still able to absolutely rip through them, tear through them. I mean, obviously, there's the hangover from from last weekend, and kind of the the psychology and the the cloud o- over his head on that thing, and, and that's. That's more the issue for me that that needs to be dispelled. We need to move on. It needs to be all positive and bright and keep it light and fluffy. I'll, we survived this. Um, he got into great situations. Uh, I'm with the the processes working. We're creating chances. It's all good. Um, strikers go through better phasers and worser phases. Sorry about that. Um, Grammatically, it was fantastic. And, right yeah, there, yeah, yeah. That whole Thanks. thing, yeah. And it'll all come good. So I'm not worried as long as 
in, in terms of him as a striker, just we got to get this last weekend's hangover behind us. He needs to show up on time. We need to forget all about it. He needs to become great, happy Obama Yang, who everybody loves and is a great captain and is a great uh, mentor to all the young guys and get back to that that psychology we had around him. And it's all good and all fun. And this will come good. So I'm not... I'm not worried as long as there's no cloud that comes with it. It's not his footballing aspects that that bother me. Yeah. I thought, you know, I thought, I think I said before this game, something along the lines of, I thought um, Sabayas would have a really good game going forward. Um, And that's the issue with him. Good going forward, although he got dispossessed while going forward but basically it's his physical aspect to be fair so did party like party came on and one of the first things he did is try to beat a man in his own defensive third and had it taken off him so you know there was something going on something in the air that night there was but at least party you know the thing about party is it's his job to be standing in the right spaces so generally he's a plus but but danny unfortunately the physical aspects mean when he gets caught out um, you're in trouble or if somebody else gets caught out, he's not going to bail you out. And the one thing about re-signing Danny, because I do like him and I would keep him at the right price, but he's just one more quirky, talented midfield midfielder. Um, we've had years of like uh, midfielders we like that we want to accommodate, but they need other midfielders to make them okay. And we've just too many of them. You know, Chak is doing great at the moment, but he has a bit of that. They all have a bit of that, apart from Thomas Party, who's balanced and can do it all. Okay, he's not in his best phase of form for us now or in the future, um, but hopefully he he gets to his full level. And the beauty of Thomas Party is he don't he doesn't need anybody else to be full functioning and good. In fact, he's the guy who'll probably make everybody else full, full functional and good. And that's the only, you know, we've just got enough quirky midfielders and have had for a long time that I think we should take the opportunity to bring in midfielders, one, two more midfielders who are complete in themselves or largely complete and don't need other people to cover their ass or to make them functional or to bring the, the sizzle they don't have or to bring the athleticism they don't have. Um, other teams of multiple midfielders who who are just downright solid and have some kind of superpower. Mm, yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, it's hard for me in a way because I look I at... I like him. Yeah, well, I, look, I mean, I, I think he has talent, but in yeah. central midfield in particular, there's there's a tactical awareness that's needed, but I, I think he's I can't see Odegaard clean. and Ceballos. There's too much... No. Like, uh, Odegaard is kind of a more physical, more energetic. But I know there are differences, but they bring a lot of the same stuff in many ways, and I just don't see us keeping both of them next year. Yeah, I mean, like, if you... You know, if you look at Ceballos and you say, can he make the passes? Can he carry the ball? Can he make a tackle? He can. I just feel like nothing he does is ever quite precise enough, crisp enough time. Like... He's got a little of the Shaka problem of everything happening one beat slower than you'd like it to, everything needing one extra touch in a very different way, um, and he possesses a different skill set, but it, it just doesn't, it feels yeah. like I, it's, I've heard it's, that it's a said step a lot. slow. Yeah. yeah, I've heard that said a lot, and I've seen some of it, but I've also seen him do exactly the opposite, so I'm not, I, I haven't really taken a position, like... That ball his, he plays his, through to Pepe. I mean, it's one yep. touch out of his feet and through. If, if Party's doing that, we're purring about it. It's the same kind of yeah. play. I, I just don't know why click, he doesn't click, do it click, enough. Then, yeah. 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 Well, good. yeah, go ahead, Clive. Mm-hmm. I don't want to pile in, but he's, he's just style. He's got a tick attacker style, slow progression, you know, surgical cuts, right? Just move people around slowly, have lots of touches. Whereas we're going from zone to zone much quicker. You know, we're trying mm-hmm. to we're trying to get wide diamonds, wide triangles quick combinations, running around the corner. So everything is, is quite is fast. It's one, two touches at most. And it's got to be done quickly because you're, you're going to lose your movement otherwise. We saw pre-Christmas what happens when our forward players don't know the when the ball's coming. They don't move. Now we're moving all over the pitch. It, honestly, mate, it's just style. It's nothing more than that. It's just style. Did you notice style. something, though? You know, you know what? This, so, Clive, I'm curious if you saw if you – well, I mean, you obviously saw it, but, like, I, I was really looking for this in particular. So – we have this thing now where when we're out of possession and we're pressing, the number 10 steps forward and becomes like the center forward in the pressing 
set up, right? Mm, so yeah. it's, it's almost yeah, more like a four three three, yeah. um, or a four four two, yeah, depending how you yeah. want to look at it. And so yeah. that's the Odegaard role. So at the weekend, if you look at the derby, <clears throat> Odegaard steps forward to step onto the ball, right? And then in this game, it's Sabios's role. And the one thing that really frustrated me, Sabios was consistently a yard or two off from where he needed to be in that first phase of pressure. And that is something that I think when he watches the film, Arteta is going to be frustrated about because. Sabayos did not switch on enough, I think, off the ball, which I think is an issue for him generally. And, you know, if you're going to be that that pressing trigger in the center of that front line and you give them space and you're all pushed up, you know, that's when you can play him behind. That's when you can play over the top. That's when you can, you know, you give those guys room to deliver. Why did Davinson, San, uh, why did San, <clears throat> excuse me, Sanchez have such a nightmare uh, in the Derby? Well, first of all, because he's a bad player, but also because he was constantly under that pressure. And I think Sabayos just didn't, didn't have the same intensity that Odegaard did in that role. And th- and that's the kind of thing where it's just work rate. It's not talent where I think Arteta will be frustrated with him. Yeah, I think um, I think Paul's got to go, actually. Oh, oh d- yeah. did, did he just mess? All right. Oh, sorry. Uh, Paul's on Twitter. Pause my pants. Thanks, Paul. Woohoo. Woohoo, indeed. Sorry. I did not spot that. Bye. <laughs> sorry. Paul. So let me let me go into this a little bit because I think it's important that you... <laughs> so, Tobias, he has, he has two ways of defending. He gambles on the challenge. Mm-hmm. That's why his tackles look quite high. And people say, oh, look at his tackles. They're 3.5 a game. Someone said if you yeah. had to tackle, you've already made a mistake. I can't remember if it was like Cannavaro or something like that. Some famous <laughs> If you got defender, to slide Maldini. tackle, you're already out of position yeah, yeah, or something like yeah. that. Right? Mm-hmm. But he gambles on tackles. So he gambles where the balls are going. The reason why he gambles is because he can't. he's not a good runner. He's not a good athlete. So he gambles on the front foot tackles. But so once he's done, he's out of the race, out of the picture. Or what else he does? He stands, he, says, hey, uh, he gets back too deep. So our problems you know, with the uh, was it the Benfica game when he jumped out of the back line because he was too deep. He jumps out, has to react, tackles in his circumference, makes a foul, free kick goal, right? So this is his problem. He's just not a natural defender. So this is how he compensates. He compensates by gambling on the front foot, and when he's positionally defends, he doesn't position himself in position to engage consistently because he's not comfortable in the little spaces where he can get dribbled past. He stands in a crowd where he's got the crowd of people around him, mm. but the centre backs will be pushing him on to go and engage in centre mid. They can tackle people higher up the pitch, and they can transition. So again, it's a style thing. He compensates for his weaknesses in a double pivot by doing one of the two things. So it's not about being defensive aware. So I think actually, let's, should we talk about Odegaard? Should we? Well, I mean, I, mean, I thought he was what? man of the match in in some ways. <laughs> I mean, he just settled everything right down. He looked fantastic. Yeah, I mean, he's. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about him. Go for it. So there, 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 there is no, you know, the 50 million that you want to spend on Tobias. Do we just move that on to the other bloke? Because we're going to need it, I think. Because I think we're unlocking something here that actually could be quite, quite special. Right. So would you say that him staying is literally priority one this summer? It's that important? I may not have said that three weeks ago. I thought, Starting let's see way. how him and Smith row, rotate together in the same position. And when they played together, I thought, well, they both look really good. When they one played, I thought he looks quite good. Is he going to get stronger? He's getting stronger. I, I fancy him to shoot. He started shooting. He scored a couple of goals. Could have scored again last night. I think we're seeing the explosion of a player right in front of us that's been waiting to come for quite a while, for quite a while. And he's now here. And last night, he came on that pitch. He didn't come on like a good football player, which he obviously is. He came on like a leader. I mean, he literally just took over. He took over that game and just told everybody, this is how you do it. You take the ball to your feet. If you are going to go two touches, don't make it the same direction. You zigzag it, touch, touch. You go one way, the other way. Unsettle your defender, turn out, move it. Get it back, move it out the other side. Jog up behind it. So simple. He has a way of playing which so suits his team. It suits it beyond belief. And I think... It, it was so clear yesterday, and sometimes something just hits you, you know. And it, watching his progression, I, I found incredibly interesting because he's one of those players. I always say that Mesut Ozil is one of the most talented players I've ever seen. I've learned so much from watching him. Odegaard is is teaching me about that position, how to play, how to drop deep, when to drop deep, how to have as many touches as the pious does, but he doesn't slow us down. And that's that's unique. That's all about preparation mm. as the ball's arriving. <clears throat> the preparation 
is so key. I talk to people all the time about this. Prep your body, prep your body shape, know your picture. If you haven't got them, have some moves that still get the ball through you quickly, but he creates a new passing lane with your movement and how you shake and bake out of it. And he's got that. He's got it. And now he's starting to show tricks on the ball as well and dribbles and stop and starts and Ronaldinho's. He's doing all this. He's not making, I'm watching this develop right in front of us really fast. Really well, he wasn't fast. playing. He wasn't playing this season and now he's playing regularly and you see the difference. You know, I mean, it, it t- it's taken him a little while, but now he looks like a guy who feels like he's one of the best in the team and he's playing like it. Um, yeah, you know, I I think it's is, he's, is, is the pace of it surprising you? I mean, um, I mean it's surprising me. I, I mean, I think his talent was never a question, and and it, you know, it, the La Liga watchers will tell you there were times last season when he was out on loan where he was a candidate for one of the best players in the league. You know, Messi, Ronaldo, not was well, Messi notwithstanding, Ronaldo doesn't play in that league anymore. But um, you know, I mean, this season he wasn't playing much, and so I, I just think it takes a little bit to get going. It was almost like his preseason at first, and now, yeah, I mean, it's. It's really impressive, and I, I, I'll i just reiterate, I think keeping him, if it's even possible, becomes a priority. And yeah, I mean, look, you're probably right. Why waste any money on Ceballos if it can just be tacked on to, to keeping Odegaard around? And and I think given that he's getting so much time and leadership and trust, and depending on how our season ends and, and what this project looks like it's going to be, I mean, God forbid we win the Europa League and wind up in the Champions League. I realize a lot has to happen for that to happen you're in a much stronger position to convince a player to stay. So let's see. Um, I still want to get to Gabriel Mart- uh, Gabriel Martinelli, who we actually got to look at. I want to get yep. to a West Ham preview, maybe touch on Hector Bellerin as well. Uh, I think some questions there. But before we do it, um, I just want to be candid with you. That that's a, that's a world class segue. As soon as you hear what the name of the oh, company is, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's CandidCo.com. You're going to want to go to CandidCo.com forward slash vision. Let me tell you why, so you know why you're going there. Look, um, teeth. Teeth are important. You know, right now, whether you're on Zoom or whether you're, you know, FaceTiming or Google duoing or Skype chatting, whatever it is, um, you know, smile is important. And I think there hasn't been enough reason to smile lately, obviously, and there hasn't been enough reason to get together with people, but that is ending and we're going to start getting together with people. And if you've got, you know, a few weeks, six, six months, you can have a straight smile. It is that easy. These are invisible aligners. That's what Candid makes. The invisible aligners are removable, they're comfortable, you get a set of them, you just keep changing them out, you follow the program, and it can straighten your teeth. Gaps, turned teeth, um, crowding, you name it. Now, one of the cool things about Candid is they uh, the treatment that they develop is prescribed and monitored by a licensed orthodontist. Like, orthodontists are expert in teeth movement. So, like, my wife works in the dental industry, she loves her dentist, but... They're not orthodontists. And this is a product that she knew about. She said, yeah, it's it's really good because it's orthodontist driven. Uh, so you are going to have a, a licensed orthodontist, not a general dentist, monitoring your program. It's all through the mail. So you don't have to go in. You don't have to do visits. You don't have to worry about any of that. And again, the average treatment is just about six months. So straighten your teeth with invisible aligners. It is thousands less. I once had this treatment um, recommended to me for a turn tooth and a little bit of, of crowding situation. And I was like, yeah, that could be good. And they wanted like $30,000. So no, not good. <laughs> but this is thousands and thousands and thousands less. So it is it is really fantastic. And you, um, you're you going to use promo code. Now, now, here's the interesting thing. You have to put our, our thing after the slash and the promo code. So it's candidco.com forward slash vision and promo code vision. Candidco.com forward slash vision promo code vision. Quick mention for Justin in Atlanta who said, When I was younger, I used to have a gap in the front and on the side. I noticed that people would always look at my mouth first, so I was looking for a fix. Candid ended up being the perfect company for me. You can't stop me from smiling now. There's no comparison. That's from a very smiley Justin in Atlanta. So go to candidco.com forward slash vision promo code vision. Save $75 on the starter kit. See uh, how it works because you know what? Straightening your teeth, not a bad thing to do. Um, and now there is a great way to do it. So, Clive, is that enough of that? Yes, yes, yep. yes, please, please. You stop. love you love please the sponsorships. Stop. I feel like that is that is the where you really thrive is the sponsorships. <laughs> they surprise me all the time, much like the stock rising and stop falling. <laughs> what I think is funny is it's I actually feel like you might be more uncomfortable with the teeth straightening one than with the, the pubic hair clipping one. Like that 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 was unexpected for me. Just uh, just the advertising in general. To, I just uh, forget about it all the time. So mm-hmm. it's all, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. No, I mean, look. Let's be clear. The the reason we do advertisements isn't even uh, for any revenue or anything like that. It's just because 
we want to feel professional. And if you don't throw in the advertisements, how's anybody going to know that the podcast is growing and thriving? So actually, um, you know, it's, it's purely for ego, Clive. I want you to feel like you're on a, a major podcast because if we didn't have any sponsorships, you might be like, oh, I need to move on to a bigger podcast. But now I can fully, in fact, in fact these aren't even real companies. I just make them up to keep you around. It's like the schmoo. Um, okay, enough of that. Let, let's talk, um, well, well, let's talk Hector Bellerin just quickly and then we'll get to Martinelli. So I can't explain it, but I feel like we're watching a player's arsenal career just end before my eyes. I, I, I think it's time to move on from him, and not because I don't love him. I do. I I feel like there's something wrong with his football right now. I don't know if it's his mechanics of how he's just moving around the pitch. His his entire game feels like it's kind of unraveling a little, and I realize he had one beautiful sort of Bellarino moment in this game where he dribbled five different guys, then lost the ball, then dribbled another guy, and then did nothing with it, to be fair, but... You know, he's kind of asleep for the ball over the top. That's probably their best chance, better than the goal they scored, and plays everyone on side. His running doesn't look clean to me. He's He just, he feels like a player who's not thriving in the role he's been given. Maybe it's a situation where if he was given that role to just run him behind, given more of the tyranny role, he, he would be better. But it's it's not happening for me. And you know I have a great affection for the player, but right now, I think he's probably fallen behind Cedric in the pecking order, and I think we may be seeing the time for him to move on for the benefit of, of, of the club and for the player. Yeah, you have to separate the player and, and the man because the man is beyond reproach, in my opinion. I think he's one of the most modern forward-thinking footballers and he's set an example in so many different areas and on the green side of things and on the, the gender side of things. I mean, God, the guy is just so rounded, it's untrue, and he's a credit to the club, right? So you have to separate that from what I've seen as a player and, you know, so I took a bit of stick for this months, maybe over a year ago for, for spotting some of these things. And again, it, it's just how he plays and it's um, how he plays is not to the direction of the team and, and then similar to Sobias. And the substitutions last night were, were telling for me because it's now starting to happen. Um, I just saw so many moments when... He wants to do certain things which are natural to him. They're his game. They're natural. And suddenly you're you're in a you're in a job like anybody, you're in a job and you've you've made your career doing two or three things really, really well. And suddenly the job changes, a new boss comes, and those two or three things are not as important as they once were. And in fact, they're actually they're actually quite a negative influence. On, on your on your overall role, they need different attributes in the new environment that you're in. And when I see players around him, he's let's be let's be honest. 2015, mm-hmm. 2015 I think he played Aston Villa in the FA Cup final. Mm-hmm. And a four two three one. Aaron Ramsey on the right, um, Urzo in the middle. I think we had Sanchez on the left, Theo up front, and Cockley and Cazorla. That's your front six, right? Aaron Ramsey was not there on the right-hand side. We know that. He goes straight into the middle. Mm-hmm. That's what he likes. Ozil drops in a little bit in the half space. Aaron Ramsey goes into the box and goes and does his stuff, right? I love that team. Hector Bellerin, on that right-hand side, literally had the right-hand side to himself, and he owned it. He owned it, and I wouldn't have changed him for a second. I wouldn't have changed him for a second. He was up and down, up and down. He literally had no help, and he drove everybody back on that side. He was absolutely fantastic. I'm sitting there watching, thinking, wow, what a player. We don't want that anymore. We need people to own their areas and know when to join, join their partners and know how to give the ball and know how to support the person in possession to create those wide diamonds that need to be far more composed, far more technical, and have more technical ability rather than straight line running. See what I mean? And Mm. it's just, again, the game has developed away from him. There's a team out there that absolutely needs him to be front-footed and push people back. Absolutely needs it. It isn't us at the moment. So, but that's fine. So let's look at what's happening because Callum Chambers comes on last night in that scenario and did fine. Mm. We needed him, right? And we all saw Cedric last week. And you could say Hector's the best player of all. But who fits the group? Cedric probably fits the group the most because he can do a bit of Hector's pressing forward. He's technically better in the last third. He's defensively, I think, okay. He hasn't quite got Hector's drive with the ball, driving for the middle third. But there's enough about how he understands the game and how he supports the partners to say, actually, mate, you could be number one. 
We had user number three three months ago. So you can see how the game is changing, it's developing. You see, actually, Callum Chambers, West Ham away, Sunday. They're quite good in the air. Got Suchek, you know, they've got good players. Antonio he likes going to back stick, quite strong. Callum Chambers could easily play versus West Ham, easily. You know, and you, and you wouldn't mind it because he's strong enough to handle mm. their big aerial players, right? So, yeah. I mean, it's a position we need to upgrade, period. Like, none of the options yeah. right now look like the level you'd want them to be at. And I include Maitland-Niles in that. He's not the right person for it, neither, just in case you're wondering yep. if I'm mm -hmm. holding on to that, because <laughs> I'm not. I've seen enough there. He's not the right person. I don't think any of them are. <laughs> we need to go and buy that player that's going to transform that side with party and whether it's Saka or Pepe on the outside. I think it's an important signing for us. I really do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And you know, look, you know, and I know not everybody listening feels this way. I adore Hector Bellerin. And I think that his quality is undervalued by a lot of Arsenal fans for what he's done most of his Arsenal career. And the minutes we put into his legs at a very young age and the level that he achieved many times in his career. But he's not achieving that level now. And football waits for no man. And the fact is, there's a lot of promise in this team and we're going in the right direction. And I don't see a fullback in the team right now that can on the right side, that can take us where we want to go. You look at Tierney and how good he is, and once again, how good he was in this game even. We need that that consistency and quality on the right. So it's a shame, but I, yeah, I, th I think it's a concern, and I certainly think the issue now between now and the end of the season is who is the right back that you trust when you're in a quarterfinal in Europe, when you're in the big games against rivals to get back in European places in the Premier League, when you're in maybe a semifinal in Europe or even a final. Is it a Callum Chambers who's played very little? and is more of a center back than a fullback? Is it Cedric? I'll be interested to see how that plays out. Clive Gabriel Martinelli finally gets on the pitch, and lo and behold, mm. you know, he looks explosive. He looks energetic. The irony is the the near assist he gets is only a near assist because Aubameyang improvises beautifully with the back heel, and it's well saved. I actually think the cut back was on earlier to the top of the box where there were a lot of free players, but his instinct is to beat the man first, so he does that, and, you know, credit to him. It still nearly works out. Um, You know, I, I think... Given given what the options look like, where it's now Smith Rowe as as the first choice on the left, not a, not a player who I thought had a great night, by the way, but so be it. Um, he, he's the first choice, and I'm happy for it. Between Willian and Martinelli, you may have a different level of positional awareness and discipline or whatever sort of intangible coach speak stuff you want to talk about. But in terms of dynamism and just the the ability to hurt the opposition with running and pressing and energy and, and end product... I don't think there's much of a comparison. I mean, is, is it time for, for Arteta to unleash Martinelli a little bit? I realize it's a 10-minute cameo against a bad team that was already beaten and chasing a tie and down to nine, 10 men. So very, very difficult to evaluate in that period. But I just I just can't help but want to see more of this player. Yeah, I mean, last night was not, not, not a great night for watching Arsenal, but actually a great night for clarity because the two players, um, Martinelli and Odegaard, to me, looked like we found two new signings, basically. That's what it looked like to me. Um, and you just sort of get excited. You had Smith Rowe, Saka, and you had Pepe to his group, and you think, crikey, that's a, that's a strong group of players developing, and 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 their ages are really, really complementary, you know, and, and how they play is quite complementary. Left footers, right footers, all pretty sharp, sharp-brained or sharp-footed, right? So... That's a very exciting group of players. But you stop falling is Willian again, you know, because Martelli's come on. He can do the Smith Row thing. He can he can do be do the Abamyang thing. His work rate is high. He gets around the box and he's quite precise. We all know he's got a banging right foot shot when it comes. He just came on the pitch and just gives gives you everything. He's sort of, he's a sort of player that if you're ever in the stadium live. You'll just walk into the pub afterwards. You'll be talking about him because he's just so dynamic and and quick and so he treats every minute as precious as any fan would do if they was able to be on the pitch. That's how he looks to me, and I just think that's an, such an incredible talent to have. That he seems to care about his career massively. And he really wants to do well. There's been a few pictures of him in training this week. You seen them pictures? A little brief, like one minute video of him mm -hmm. yep. in some individual finishing training. And everyone's had a look at it. Oh, he's going to be a centre forward. He's going to be a centre forward. I think that's really that training is really it's just finishing drill. Basically, it's really mm -hmm. he looked really good in that. You know, 
And he start then think about what's happening in Man City right now with these no centre forwards, you know, double double false nines and things like that. Hey, Arsene Wenger did it first. He played Arshavin there. <laughs> yeah, he did. And you look at this, you look at this, and what do you need in that position? You need somebody that moves quickly from into areas where the ball are. I mean, I that sounds obvious, but you need people that can shift position, secondary movement, shift position, get it, set it, go again. What like, what is Lacazette did really well against Spurs? He got it, set it, fought, battled. The go again bit wasn't quite there, right? He got there, and you know, he got. He had to wait for a taxi to get there, get back into the box, right? So he looks light into the box. Can you imagine Martelli playing that false nine-ish role with a good ten next to him, getting it, giving it, mm. going again, shifting your position, second mover, get it, give it, go, run off lines. Odegaard needs a runner. Someone wants to run through lines, not stop and don't trust him. Run through lines. People that move, people that want to be in space to receive the cross from Saka or Pepe or a slip pass from Smith Rowe. I mean, it is really exciting, the potential of somebody that moves like he does off the ball. You know, we talk about Sabayas earlier and his off the ball movement. <clears throat> Excuse me, this this guy has got some exciting attributes. And I'm not one of them that says he's going to be like um, Ronaldo or the rest of it. I read all this stuff. I'm thinking, nah, just wait for him to happen. Because two years ago in the podcast on Guendouzi, we were building statues for, after, for him after one game. Things can change really quickly. But there is something in this kid. And there is. And he fits this group. I'm sure about it. Much we talk about Tobias and Barry maybe walking out of the group. The group's developing away from them. This group is developing towards Odegaard and Martinelli. I think that's really, really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And, I, you know, look, we... We always have a nervousness when we don't see the young players we like breaking through right away. We have this impatience for them to get their chance. But, you know, to be fair, the team is playing pretty well right now and everything's going, you know, in the right direction. And I understand that people don't want to see a lot of Willian on the pitch. But, you know, Martinelli, you know, he, he's still very, very young. And the season is in the absolute most critical stage. He got starts against Chelsea and United. It's not like the kid has not been trusted ever. Um, so I'm not too worried. I, I think that, that he has a big future at the club and that that future is being protected and cared for and, and planned. And I'm not saying that's always been the case with all the young players. I'm not saying we've always done that right. <clears throat> but in this particular instance, I find myself less concerned about it. Before we finish off with a, a, a little West Ham preview, Clive, you know, I, I do look at central midfield and I say it is such an interesting place for Arsenal because I think it has been... a. a an area that we have really struggled for many, many, many seasons. Um, you know, since the days of, of Cesc Fabregas, really. I, I mean, we had Santi Cazorla, but we part, partnered him with players like Francis Coughlin. I know some people really rate Coughlin, and, and I never particularly did. But, I mean, that was like the bare minimum of what you could get by with. A very sort of defensive specialist type player to go with a, a player that could do, do it all. You know, we, we bought Thomas Party. He struggled with injury a little bit. And as a result, maybe struggled with with being a 90-minute player for us. Granit Xhaka has looked better with him. But on this day when he's paired with Elneny, you really see the deficiencies in both, I felt. I thought it was a bad day for central midfield. And then Party came on and didn't look particularly clean and crisp either. I still think central midfield is an area that has to be addressed this summer. I think Thomas Party's a very good player. And I'm glad we have him. And I, I think he's, he's a big upgrade. And when he's on it, you see the difference. I still think we need a 1B to his 1A or a, a, a 1 double A, um, you know, to shore up that that area. Did you have a different feeling about Granit Xhaka seeing him have to play the the 1A role with Elneny versus being, you know, being next to to party? Because I thought central midfield was just, was just generally a, a really big problem in this game. Yeah, it was, it was a problem. The stability and control in that space was wasn't great. Um, Elneny and and Tobias they offer certain things, but they can't really consistently control the game. And 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 Shaka suffers because of it. And he doesn't always control games unless he's you know I shouldn't say that he he tries to control games. His whole his whole game is about that. But on occasions he can obviously lose control. Right. Yeah. So um, so the way we seem to use midfield at the moment that central pivot is really left quite alone yet we play into that pivot quite a lot right so so it's in, if I'm you've seen other teams now sort of zero in on that area three and fours so when party receives it and he does a no touch turn and goes past two people and we break through we're in business when he doesn't oh Tom's party's had a bad game 
But really, we're trying to almost isolate that player. It's, it's mm. quite risky. I think as the ball's travelling, I think we need to create a little bit more connectivity around that central player. Just make sure... You know, the party, when we went through... When the Bamiyan scored, may have been in um, Olympiakos, when party did the little one-two with Shaka and it went through out to Willian. And, you know, with that, that goal, we went through mm-hmm. and it just we stuck it in. That's the sort of thing we need to do more of. Get around him to create the wall pass so we can not get pressed because I think we're leaving that space too big. We're asking the right back to be a right midfielder. We're asking Shaka to sort of tuck in on the left-hand side. And sometimes our spacing can be wrong and we are isolating people and they're losing the ball. So the midfield, uh, Shaka and Party are the best two, but I mean, they're miles. The problem is what we do underneath them. Uh, El Nenny, I think it's a, a fine young man, obviously very popular in the squad. Um, he's asked for a new contract. I bet you have, mate. Um, but <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> isn't I'm isn't not sure. the funny thing is, Cla- isn't this exactly the kind of game where you, where you see his limitations? A game where you're the dominant team and you need that central midfielder to add a little ball progression, a little. I mean, he tried to play some some through balls in this game tried. that were just five yards short of their target. Yeah, he tried. He tried. I, I like the I like the guy. I like what he tries to do. I think he gets the game. I can't see when his next good game is coming and then it suddenly happens. And I can't see when his next bad game coming and it suddenly happens. He's indicative of the team and what I spoke about earlier. He represents a floor we need to lift. Right? So Yeah, yeah, that's what's so awesome. lift the floor. We need to lift it. Right? We need another player in there. We need to have three for two and a kid, a kid or two, to, um, to make it four or five in that centre mid, two position behind the ball. We we need to do that. We need to just accept they're not there. And we need to get somebody that is, that's mm-hmm. going to lift and take over Shaka's role because Shaka's going to be there for maybe one more year and then he's done. That's what I think, but I might be wrong. He's also a, a very key person in, within the club because he plays every minute of every single game. Right, So we need to lift it. You know, I remember when Wenger gave Flamini a, a contract just because he turned up to training. I just thought that was lazy recruitment, lazy. It was never going to take us anywhere. He was an okay player. We got to get rid of OKs, move past them. The only ones that are OK that we should be dealing with are the kids that are 20, 19, 20. They're OK at that age. They didn't cost us anything. They're only going to get better. I could deal with OK, kid. I can't deal with OK 29-year-olds. Well, that's not where we need to be. Mm. Right? So um, so I hope we do that there and recognise this is this is what we need to do so Shaka can rest and parties can rest. He doesn't break down. Party plays five or six more games. I'm sure we've got more points than we actually have. Our, our, what we felt we had to do bringing him back against Spurs was not right. I know it, it may be unfortunate. I know he was injury tested, etc. But to me, we should be like we should have been comfortable giving him two more weeks. But we weren't, you know, because we were we knew the deficit in quality, you know. So we should be more comfortable. We, we've attacking mids now. We can. Jack has got an injury. We, there's no stress. We like to see him back. But we got players. We talk about Martinelli, we talk about Odegaard, we talk about Smith Rowe, we talk about Pepe. We're okay, right? We can deal with it. We have that in centre midfield, we can't, right? So that tells you the deficiency. So there's a few names in my head, Elliot. I'm not sure what's in your head, but a few names in mine. There's um, very I'm little sure in, my, what... in, in my head. Wind, rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I'm not sure what you're going to do. I'm not sure what you're going to do. Generally, not sure what you're going to do. But it's a, I, got, I got some ideas, but yeah, we just need to do it wherever it is. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think. You know, it's funny because people will say to me, I- I've generally been a guy who said, like, squad is not that important. That that it, we overstate the extent to which it's a squad game when really it's a first 11 game. And that as you strengthen your first 11, you insulate yourself from the squad mattering as much. And you say, oh, really? Well, when party's not out, when party's not there, look how bad our central midfield looks. That shows you why you need a squad. My, my answer to that, Clive, is that actually, if you have two excellent first choice central midfielders, then you don't really need as strong a squad because you have ideally, you know, unless you're just totally banjacks with injuries like a Liverpool right now, you have one excellent one out there, right? So right now we're playing party with whoever he's playing with someone we think is below the level we'd like to be at. Let's say you had two players of party's level and one of them is out. Whoever the other guy is in is probably going to work. Because we, we, we've even seen it right now. Party plus one mediocre guy works. Two mediocre guys doesn't work. So as long as you have you know one of them, you're fine. So I think if we had two 
really star talented central midfielders. And then your bench is maybe an academy player like a Willick or Maitland Niles, or it's, you know, someone of a lower level. You can live with that someone of a lower level because ideally they're only replacing one of your excellent players when they have to play. Um, Right now, when you rest party, whatever central midfield pairing you're putting out there is two guys, both of whom are probably below the level. And that's what I think you need to avoid. So let's look ahead to this weekend. And things are starting to shake shake out in a place pretty clearly, Clive, as we face West Ham this weekend. I think mm. Smith Rowe on the left. Odegaard obviously has to start. One of our best players right now. I, I think Aubameyang will start, even though obviously he missed all the chances. Um, it'll be Shaq and Party, assuming they're both fit. Although Shaq is playing 90 minutes every single game, and I don't know how long that can go on. You'd assume it'll be Tierney. I I guess Gabriel and Louise continue, because right now they look like first choice to me. Um, Cedric probably comes back in for Bellerin. Leno gets the, the, the starting goal. The interesting question I have for you is, especially having been called up to England and with three games this week, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Does Saka get another rest? I mean... Pepe is playing well enough right now, and I don't think this was a great game against Olympiacos, but he looked dangerous like he always does. Is he playing well enough right now to have made an argument to, to keep that spot over Saka, who could probably stand to to take a little bit more of a rest and just sharpen up? Again, I, I don't want to suggest he's been bad. I mean, even in the derby, where I, my first instinct was he was off the game a little bit, it's really just that we were roasting them on the left, so that's what we emphasized. Uh, is that really the lone position where there's an argument, and, and do you think it's a fair argument? Yeah, selfishly, I'd like to see Saka not go of England. I think they played three games mm. in like six or seven days. I mean, crikey. Mm. San Marino, Albania, I think it's Poland. Right, so three games. So he, he won't totally play all those games. <laughs> and what, what are we doing? You know, we, you could ask yourself a question, what are we doing? Why are we doing international football right now? We, I, I, let's not go there, right? So mm. it's, well, it's well, at least they're qualifiers at least, right? So but selfishly... He's got a hamstring. If he doesn't play the weekend, maybe he doesn't go. And he gets the rest he so dearly needs, right? And so for our, for what now, this draws come in, Europa League. You know, if we beat West Ham on the weekend, we, 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 we're really starting to look upwards and get connected to people. And we're going to need Saka. We're going to really need him. We're going to need him fit and rested and fresh because the rest of the season is opening out. You've got a three to five year project manager. He could chop a year off that project real quick if he can win the Europa League. And this club's in a different place completely as the world is opening up. And we're going to have a V-shaped economy bounce back. Football's going to try and do the same. We need to be positioned in a top-level competition. This is a huge period for Arsenal coming up. And so being selfish as an Arsenal fan, I want that kid sitting on his backside watching East Enders. I don't want him travelling around you know, Eastern Europe, right, you see? So, um, so that's what I'd like to see happen. But... Um, I, I will say again, the introduction of Martinelli last night is a is a really important factor for the rest of the season and um, how we use these minutes, particularly in Europe with the five subs. I think it's going to be useful. I think Smith Rowe's another player. Don't get too hot too early. He hasn't strung a series of games together on the bounce where he looks really fresh. We got to we got to deploy that player and then take him out and then deploy him again. He fatigues, obviously, during games. We need to build up his robustness as an adult pro. And players like Saka and, and Martinelli allow him to have that time off. We must not over-rely on these players. We must rotate them and use them and make them feel all part of this. You know, I think it's really key. We tend to get into first 11 syndrome. And, and I don't I don't look at that. I look for the how the group are working together. And I think those players obviously work well together. So yeah, yeah keep Saka on his backside, me. And Pepe's worked really hard last night. I don't know if you noticed that. His work rate was tremendous. His output wasn't great. I thought he was very unfortunate with that Smith Rowe block, you know, and um, he's got a goal in him. And I think, um, yeah, I think I wouldn't bother me if he played at the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is sort of interesting, right? I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, do you think Smith Rowe, has the goals in him. I mean, he, he clearly has the ability to set up chances. He, he unlucky not to score in the Derby. I mean, he's, he's been told to, to practice his shooting more in, in training by Arteta. I think, you know, my, my, you know, my argument with, with Iwobi and my feeling is always your forwards have to have goals in them. Pepe clearly does. In my view, Saka does. Um, Obama, <laughs> that's all he does. Odegaard's starting to look like he has him. He's, he's got a couple now. I think Smith Rowe maybe. Ha- I mean, do do you think there's enough goals in that front line now? If if Smith Rowe is is a regular first choice option there, 
I think I think he does. I think he will. And he's, he's, you know, that shot the other day, was, <laughs> he's thinking about it as well. Even last night, when the ball hit him in his face, <laughs> when he bounced back, I mean, that was that was going to goal. I mean, he's not messing about. He knows what it takes to play for Arsenal. He need, and he's adding those skills to his game. You know, so I've I've learned a lesson to stop underestimating him. You know, I think physically there's a there's a there's a challenge there, but not football wise. I think he really under he really gets the game of football. He really does. He wants to impact the team. He wants to play. He really wants to play, much like a, a lot of those guys do. And some of them just play, but some of them really want to play. It's been it's really clear this year that some of these inexperienced players that we're desperate to see play. <laughs> some of the older players we're debating. And we're debating our captain at the moment. Let's be honest. I mean, he showed a he showed a bit of mental fragility, shall we say, last night, which affects his technique under pressure. I'm afraid it's something that when he's when he's hot, he's so hot, everything flows. But the moment there's a little bit of a problem, we can lose him. Mm. And we can all see it. We can all the camera flashes to his face, and we can all see it. He's a sensitive soul. He's somebody that needs to feel the rhythms. He needs to feel right. He needs to feel happy, and when it's all right, it just comes out. But he can be knocked off that path real quick. And we've made it also, we've made it nice and comfortable and cozy for him. And um, he, you know, he needs to he needs to carry on doing what he's doing to you know repay this club. And if he's got a period coming up, and I keep saying this, there's a period coming up that could change the the, the near term future history of this club if we qualify for Champions League at a time when football is losing money and we are losing money, this is the time to get back. And we can't do it without Aubameyang, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, well said. So uh, just as a last thought, do you have expectations for this game? West Ham have been good. I mean, they, they I keep expecting them to, to fall, but I mean, you look at their underlying metrics and you look at the way they're playing and, you know, Moyes has kind of resurrected himself from having been a joke for a little while there to back being sort of just a reliable Premier League manager and they they know what they do and they do it pretty effectively. I I think this could be a harder game than maybe people are expecting given our form. They're good. They're they're just a solid good team. They don't concede a ton. Uh they score a fair amount. I mean, do you have an idea of maybe where they might be weak and how we can attack them or how they might try to hurt us? They have size. Yeah, so, That's definitely a part of their game. Yeah, the discussion I was having earlier on about creating a, a higher floor. That's exactly what West Ham have done. They've added in Dawson, they nicked from West Brom, I think, a physical centre back to sort of offer them solidity on the right hand side. Kufal and Suchek, I never heard of before they arrived, but they're absolutely solid pros. And Suchek scored a million goals this year. They moved away from Bart Noble, who was a player that West Ham fans love, but also recognise he can be run off his feet in games. So they moved Suchek in there and they play him and Rice together, and they've added. A lone player, it's as good as our lone player, you know, from an impact point of view, in you know, Lingard. Lingard's come in and he's just breaking in, in and around Antonio as a free running third midfielder, as a 10. And he's scoring goals. He scored four goals in the last six games. Back in England squad for the first time in two years. Everyone's smiling. Then they got, they're sort of, they've had a level of physicality down the gut. And they got some breakaway fours that can sprint, you know, Lingard and Antonio, backed by four nails, Ben Rama or whoever. Well, Jared Bowen's not a bad player. I think they got from Hull, lefty on the right, he works really hard. So Moyes has got a hard working group working to his style of football. We lose the ball, we work hard. We get it forward into right areas. We bang loads of crosses in, we're quite good in the air. And anyone, every time you're near an Arsenal player, they're going to feel you. Bang. So I think it's going to be a test. They're sitting home resting. You know, sitting there watching TV, watching Bargain Hunt, sitting there, and so we've been we've been in Europe, being stressed out, and I'll come the back of a Spurs game where we were quite emotional. So, I would think about this game slightly differently. I would look at us and say, I got an eye for I don't know why I got an eye for I don't mind who plays right back, Chambers or Cedric, but I think probably I've got on Cedric maybe I wouldn't mind if Chambers played, but I do think it's time to maybe put Holding back in for this game. I think. Um, David Luiz just showed a few signs early on until he started to focus late on. That he's had a lot of football recently. And he, with David Luiz, you just got to know when to take him out before he does something stupid. But because he's playing really well, but you just got to make sure that you get to him before his brain goes <laughs> and, he does a, and he does a wolves on you. 
Gabriel for me is just like unbelievable, right? Just unbelievable player and only going to get better. So for this game, uh, Antonio, he's a runner. You got to make sure you got someone who can run with him. The worry is that Elliot, that Tierney, he's irreplaceable, isn't he? There's yeah, he nothing really else. Is. He just he, he, you know, I'm looking at games now, thinking, oh, if we all scored those goals about me, we could have took we could have took Tierney off. That's how I'm watching games now, because there is there is nothing to get near him, you know, and um. The normal two in midfield, and I, I would go, you know, I, I, it didn't really bother me. I think Aubameyang should play, um, but if Lacazette starts and Aubameyang's on the left, it doesn't worry me now. I think it's, there's a level developing here that as um, long as we rotate up effectively and are, and are quite fresh, I think the Leicester game told us that be comfortable with rotation, make sure the players on the pitch are healthy and fresh enough to go and play, and I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. I mean, the irony is if you wanted a perfect comp, for us, in terms of underlying metrics, it's West Ham for the season. Because, I mean, we're taking 11.75 shots per 90. They're taking 11.71 shots per 90. We have allowed 32.7 expected goals. They have allowed 32.1 expected goals. We have scored, mm-hmm. we have we have tallied 39.3 expected goals. They have tallied 38.1. So the ironic thing is, very, very similar underlying metrics in attack and defense. But you lose sight of the fact that that doesn't take into account all of our metrics looking so much better since Boxing Day. Right? I mean, when I say, think about this, we're at 11.71 uh, shots per 90. We were at seven for the first half of the season. <laughs> right? So, I mean, you know, we're taking a ton more shots, a lot more expected goals, and a lot fewer expected allowed in, in the run. So I, I think... Even though we look very similar as teams overall, obviously in terms of the way we've been playing lately, you know, we're the better team. Now, they have a game in hand, and they are seven points ahead of us in fifth. Clive, this okay. game, the Liverpool game, the Everton game, the, these are the ones we have to win. We, we yep. beat, we, and Chelsea, I should throw in there. So, you know, we beat Spurs. That had to happen. Everton, Liverpool, West Ham, Chelsea. Those are the teams above us. Those are the teams we have to beat. This is, this is the one you just, you feel... If we if we want to get into those European places, I don't know how you can drop points in these games. So I mean, is this? I mean, they're all must wins, right? We put ourselves in such a hole, but this is this is an opportunity to go into the international break, looking like we're a legitimate contender for a European place. I think by winning the derby, we upped our chances from something like ten percent in the statistical models to twenty percent, doubled our chances with that one win, and I I think we'd be odds on to potentially finish in the top top six or seven if we can get past West Ham this weekend. Yeah, so we do, we do quite well at West Ham. Mm-hmm. We've, we've got the same games, actually. I think our goal difference is two apart. But that just should, West Ham are where we should be without doing anything much different, yeah. apart from being not so stupid, basically. Take out the stupidity. Take out the silly mistake at the start of Villa, the stupidity at Burnley and the stupidity at Wolves. And we're right there. We're right where they are. And that's where we should be. That's where this team should be. Um, I said before, the, the league tables never never lies. It lied in 2003 when we lost the league. And it's lying right now because we're better than this. And we're just not doing it. Every time I believe they do something stupid. Last time I really started to believe we, we bumped into walls. If we beat West Ham, we can sit back and really have a good assessment on where we are post-Christmas, where we are, where we're heading. As a group of players, they've got to be thinking, hold on. This opens a door to the last, you know, the last quarter of the season. This opens a huge door to what we should get in Arsenal back to where they should be. And one away game at West Ham against a rested West Ham, if we can produce, and it's really about efficiency of finishing. And Arteta said it months ago, but it really is. Ellie. You you must know this, mm-hmm. knowing numbers. It is about what we do in the box. It really is. If we can just do what we need to do in the box, then we're going to be fine. Because we build up really well. We build up really well. A couple of stupid issues at the back door because we're building up too much. But we build up really well. We've got a great way of playing and we look like we know what we're doing. We get into the box. I'm still not confident yet. Yeah, we've got a fantastic centre forward. So we're adding some more goals around that player, which I think the reliance on him is decreasing. And I'm, and I'm, again, we just got to, he's got to deal with that mentally. He's got to deal with the fact he's just a player for us. But I know we need him. Because we need him to be above his XG like he was last year. And if he does that, we can have a great end of season, I promise you. They played a lot of the big teams lately um, since the turn of the year. And they lost to Liverpool. 
They lost to United in the Cup. They also lost to United in the League. They lost to City in the League. They beat Tottenham, but what does that tell you? Everybody beats Tottenham. Um, But they haven't given much away in those games. The interesting thing is for the last two or three months, they've been playing at about 38% possession. So you're you're all about this, Clive. I mean, this is, we're going to have the ball. We're going to have the dominance of territory. We have to be clinical because they are getting results by not having the ball. And that scares me a little bit. Um, you look at what Olympiacos tried to do, you know, similar kind of thing. One long kick from the goalie to to send a guy in at the back. We 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 can't give the ball away stupidly. We can't shoot ourselves in the foot. No no Granite Shaka turnovers in the third minute to go one nil down. No silly giveaways. Dominate the territory. Turn it into chances. Take your chances. That's how it works. Um, so let's just see. We'll see what happens. I'm excited for it though. Uh, I'm enjoying watching Arsenal right now, which makes a nice change. And uh, then we have two weeks without without the Arsenal, which is insane that we're doing this, but we're doing it. So, Clive, um, that, that does it for me. That do it for you? Yeah, I think we just played like we did against Spurs, basically, by the sound of it. They mm-hmm. they tried to sit off us, didn't they, and wait for our mistakes. And we were really accurate about passing and deliberate. Same again, nice and calm, deliberate build-up, and we'll take them. Don't it's worry. also, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's also a, a chance for Aubameyang to maybe, we thought angry Obama Yang would take it out on Olympiacos, taking it out on West Ham be fine for me. So we'll leave it there. Clive's on Twitter, Clive BFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. My name's Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter. And Gunner, thank you so much for being here with us, everybody. Appreciate it. We'll have the instant reaction on Sunday after that game and then the full match pod on Monday. And then we'll come up with some fun stuff to do during the uh, international break to keep the content flowing if the Arsenal football is not. So fingers crossed for the weekend that we continue to move onward and upward. Please have one good laugh at Spurs. Remember, we can't smile without them. So we got to thank them for that. We love you and we'll talk to you after Arsenal 10. West Ham News.